Russia's economy right now is a terminal patient, but its oil and gas and commodities sales mean that it has access to the best medicines in the world. Maximilian Hess is a Russia expert at the Foreign Policy Research Institute and an author of the book Economic War Between Russia and the West. We talked about how long can Russia sustain the war in Ukraine, why its economy is more resilient than we thought, and why sanctions don't work exactly as we expected them to. Enjoy. All right. Perfect. Perfect. So, Max, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Right. Um, so I'd like to start uh, with a bit of a, a historical um, parallel in the beginning. And you wrote a book about the economic war between the West and Russia. And there's this funny thing about the wars that Russia has been in in the past mm. 200 years, and especially the ones that it has lost. Um, and that's the fact that quite often the defeat wasn't necessarily on the battlefield itself. It was an outright military defeat, but it was because the Russian economy has sort of fallen uh, apart in the middle of it. And I guess my question is, are we going to see the same outcome in the war that's happening now between Russia and Ukraine? Well, um, you know, I think that that really depends on how much longer this fight continues for and how strong the West's resolve is and continues to be. Of course, there are questions being raised now, in, in particular in the United States, about withdrawing support. We just, uh, Valery Zaluzhny, the commander-in-chief of, of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, uh, in an interview the other day said, he, for the first time openly, look, the situation at the front is a stalemate. What will depend is on the technological changes on both sides. Of course, you Ukraine is due over the next few months to get the F-16s, and uh, hopefully in the coming weeks, although we may get a government shutdown beforehand, um, get additional support from the United States. And I do think overall, despite the tensions that will happen in Washington in the next few weeks and then with the election leading up, that there cont will continue to be strong support there. Um, but the Russian economy can really continue to hold out for a long time. Yes, it's true that in past wars, you know, uh, over the last 150 or so years, that the Russian economy falling behind has been a key re reason, sometimes against underestimated players, as Putin miscalculated uh, with Ukraine and its ability to withstand the intervention, as well as the West's ability to put him under economic constraints and offer support for Ukraine. Uh, of course, the Russian Empire uh, misjudged Japan in 1905. Um, ultimately, that conflict was settled uh, with a peace agreement, but one that um, left many of the fundamental issues in Russia uh, unaddressed and the czarist regime was unwilling to. But, you know, going back to Russia's sort of state now, I think we have to understand is the Russian economy has gone from being an autocracy with the elements of, of, Campbell, of capitalism to a true autarkic state. Um, the reality is, is Russia can hold out as an autarkic, even non-market economy entirely for a very long time, right? The Soviet Union did um, for, for 70 years. What I think the sort of best way to describe it is, is Russia's economy right now is a terminal patient, but its oil and gas and commodities sales mean that it has access to the best medicines in the world, right? So it, it has cancer, essentially, but... Um, the best access to chemotherapy, alternative medicine, and others because the Russian state can still uh, afford them. Uh, that's a real challenge for sanctions to completely change, especially as it is not in the Western and global interest to drive Russian commodity exports to zero. You know, Western countries are democratically accountable. If that happens and oil prices go to $200 and inflation is horrible again over the next year, then it's very unlikely that many of the governments that pursued those policies will still be in power one, two, three years from now in democratic cycles. Putin doesn't have to worry about that. Um, so in, in some ways, is it continues to be a uh, war of economic attrition as well and who can hold out for longer and who's willing to accept more pain. And I do worry that Russia is, is willing to accept quite a bit more pain. We've seen the West fail to make mistakes uh, or continue to make mistakes in negotiating with Putin in the past, thinking they can stop his aggression. Um, and... Uh, 
while I'm hopeful and I think that there's a lot of good signs both from the Ukrainians on the battlefield and from the just how strong the international coalition has been, as I describe in the book, um, we would be foolish to, re- uh, to rest on our laurels and think that um, these sanctions now mean that it is just a matter of time uh, uh, until there is change in Russia. Mm. Uh, let's unpack some of the things that you said. What is actually the Russian economy today? Because it seems like it's a bit of a black box and especially and it has been since the beginning of the war because in the beginning it seemed like uh, we have imposed sanctions like we have never seen before and that they're gonna destroy completely the russian economy within a matter of weeks um then that didn't happen and russian leadership now loves to say that Uh, their economy is sanction proof um, and that there was no damage done at all. But that doesn't seem to be true either. So what is actually the shape of the Russian economy today, two years, almost two years into the war? And do we actually have the verifiable data and the information to be able to say something with certainty? So the Russian government did restrict a lot of the data that they were publishing in the initial months after the war. Some of that data, particularly on trade, can be inferred from other countries' statistics. The Kremlin actually just started publishing some more detailed trade data again in, in, in the last few weeks, but still nowhere near the pre-2022 levels. Um, of course, through speaking with people in Russia, through Uh, understanding those trade figures, investment figures, um, and the status of r- Russian business and where it is trading and dealing with other countries does offer a lot of inferences. You know, what I would say is the Russian economy today is nothing like what it was pre-2022. You know, mm. uh, entrepreneurialism, um, investment, foreign investment, even by Russian allies, has gone to, to almost zero. You know, the sort of descriptions at the beginning of, oh, Russian GDP may fall 5, 20, 15 ended up by, you know, World Bank statistics being not quite one and a half percent. Um, you know, th- th- those sort of belie the reality that, of course, you know, GDP um, also constitutes, right, um, consumer spending, government spending, investment, exports, imports. Russian exports gained a lot of value last year, right, as the oil um, and, and uh, gas price shocks really meant that the Kremlin was actually able to earn oil more money even from uh, exporting lower values, uh, lower, lower volumes than it ever had before. Um, the government has dramatically increased uh, military spending on track to have it be more than 200% higher uh, than it was at the beginning of the war by the end of this year. Uh, and, you know, of course, already had spent far more on defense than the, as a percentage of GDP as, as the majority of other countries. Um, the Russian economy, I think, today is best really understood, as it has been for a long time, but in, even more clear now as a um, commodities extraction enterprise that is a arm of the state. Um, You know, Russian engineering, uh, Russian science, these things that, you know, have historically been such great contributors to um, global trends and global development um, have really slowed down. You know, the brain drain is very significant. Russia does have a lot of success in uh, procuring sanctioned technologies, some of which are just very hard to, to restrict. But the idea that Russia will be developing its own uh, engines, chips, um, uh, machine lathe, CNC tools uh, to replace those that it has gotten abroad anytime soon is, is fanciful. Um, there's also large shortages in the workplace that uh, are in part a result of the draft and of course the the large number of Russians uh, who have uh, fled that and the consequences of the war um, you know the the idea that there will be real term growth in, in Russia outside of what happens in the commodity sector um, is, is rather unthinkable right now what Russia also lacks is any kind of really um, major credit market domestically of course there are banks there are mortgages you know the government supports them even now they just announced uh, additional government subsidied mortgages to buy houses in the far east and in 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 the arctic regions um but i'm talking about direct lending from other countries uh you know sometimes we get big headlines like oh chinese lending to russian corporations is up 700% uh over the course of the last year uh, that is true but of course chinese lending to russian corporations still remains uh, under 20% 
percent, I believe it's closer to ten um, or even less uh, of what Western loans to Russia were uh, pre the conflict and certainly pre um, Russia's first invasion of Ukraine in in 2014. Um, so it, it, it is, as I said, an, an economy on life support, um, but th- that doesn't mean that that can't continue um, for a very long time. And of course, a lot of uh, the Kremlin's propaganda is aimed at driving home the message. Of course, this is all the West's fault. This is, you know, we are right in our war in Ukraine. They are wrong for abusing their economic power to put us under these sanctions. Uh, Putin, you know, increasingly talking, um, as he has for a long time, almost his entire time in the presidency, but putting increasing weight behind a lot of his efforts to, or at least attempting to, um, to challenge sort of dollar hegemony in the international Mm. order. You know, we saw at the BRICS summit, right, just a a few months ago and during the summer, um, you know, Putin uh, had uh, called and Russia had proposed, oh, well, we need the the BRICS structure to agree an alternative currency and we can um, then have this great sort of dollar free world and it will expand um, our abilities to do business, uh, ours being BRICS here, and it will mean that, um, you know, sanctions and other threats won't be as effective. Uh, And of course, that went nowhere. It wasn't even put on the agenda at the conference. Um, And because of the realities of the strength of that international economic order, and it's important to to a country like South Africa, Putin couldn't even come to the summit himself. He's under an ICC warrant, Mm. and um, South Africa is a member of the Rome Statute, uh, which it was unwilling to to violate in this case. Um, You know, I South uh, uh, South Africa has violated the Rome Statute before to allow the former dictator of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir, um, to travel to that country while under an ICC warrant. Um, so I think a lot of the lessons that, that actually need to be learned from the last year of this full-fledged economic war between Russia and the West are actually just how much stronger West institu- Western institutions are than we often appreciate. And I think a large part of the reason for that is because uh, although the sanctions and trade controls and other tools now really use the the strength of that system and rely on it as key tools of U.S. Uh, and European foreign policy. The European Union, for example, is also expanding its sanctions agenda to allow secondary sanctions externally. So essentially what that means if you use euros in a transaction uh, between, um, you know, I don't know, Mozambique and the Bahamas, that still comes under the European legal purview, just as any transaction now uh, involving dollars uh, under U.S. authority does. Um, and I think a lot of the reasons and why we failed to learn um, the lessons of actually the strengths of the system as well as some of the challenges that Russia and countries like it would like to pose is because we don't always understand just how this system um, came about. And that's in in large part because I I think it wasn't actually uh, intentional. Certainly if you ask Putin or um, North Korea or uh, uh, Cuba, they can give long histories of of U.S. use of economic weaponry, and I certainly think that's true. But the real role of dollar hegemony and, and the financial networks that under Pin it weren't the result of uh, direct government policies, but often their inadvertent result over the last 70 years. If we get back to the beginning for a little bit, talking about sanctions, you mentioned that the original expectation was that they could bring down the Russian economy by uh, the Russian GDP by uh, perhaps even 20%. And that didn't happen. Uh, you mentioned that the In 2022, it fell by one, maybe two percent, and this year it might grow. Um, Why didn't the sanctions work in the way that we initially expected them to? Do we have completely unrealistic expectations, or is it that Russia is actually a lot better at evading the sanctions than we thought? I think it's that we... um In some ways, we're giddy with their success. Um, You know, we saw everyone uh, outside the EU and the United States, um, not not that every single country complied with the sanctions, but um, or or said that they would bring them in, in. into their own legislation. Many countries, including a few Western allies, most notably Georgia, for example, have not, or or Turkey, um, but that they really did cause the ending of key Russian business relationships across the West and internationally as well. And of course, sanctions uh, were introduced by some non-Western countries or countries at the periphery of the West that hadn't done so before, Switzerland, South Korea, and and Singapore, most notably. Um, 
so, you know, I, I think then sort of that set the expectation very high that, wow, this is really such a, a, a magic tool. Um, and then secondly, it was really an underst- a failure to understand um, what exactly constitutes Russia's GDP and wealth and the Kremlin's ability to respond to that. Um, so, you know, let's take, for example, the sanctions on Russia's central bank, over $300 billion uh, of some $600 billion in its reserves, immediately frozen, still can't be touched by the Russian state today. Um, gas prices spike, you know, th- that $300 billion, however, doesn't get subtracted from Russia's GDP by doing that, mm. right? That's not, GDP statistics don't calculate that. Um, and then uh, the vast increase of gas prices, meaning that Russia was earning tens of billions a month um, from gas sales more than it had before. Um, you know, the, that makes it look like, oh, well, you know, this is providing a huge boost to Russia's GDP. And then obviously this big detracting factor in the freezing of, of, of those um, sovereign assets doesn't um, immediately get done. So, you know, in some ways, I think it's more a reflection of... of um, the challenges in using GDP as, as a tool to calculate uh, everything in a country's um, economic performance, right? Um, you know, the uh, you, you can take that on the flip side and, and, and look at sort of the European GDP star over the last few years, which is Ireland, right? Mm. Um, and gross national income in Ireland has actually only gone up very slowly since the European financial crisis. Um, but because of sort of tax legislation and how Ireland books uh, is, a lot, is used by multinational corporations um, to book their corporate profit taxes for intellectual property and earnings outside of the United States, um, Irish GDP looked like, I think in 2015, it went up 25%, 2017, 15%, right? Um, uh, And in Russia, you know, one important point to remember is that leaving aside the sort of GDP statistics in terms of gross national income and and the basket of goods that the Russian consumer could buy, uh, the peak of essentially your average Russian's wealth on a power purchasing purchasing power parity measured scheme compared uh, to other countries is still 2013, and, and, and Russia has never gone back uh, to that level um, since the first invasion of Ukraine and initial sanctions in 2014. Uh, got close pre-COVID, um, still hasn't recovered, and, and um, remains at, at a level below that. And like I said, I, I don't think, even if we see changes in Ru- you know, Russian, if oil prices go up 30 40% last year and next year, Russian GDP is going to grow by a few mm. percentage points. Um, is the purchasing power and, and, and the... Uh, PPP adjusted income of the average Russian going to go up? No. So in other words, the GDP in this case is not the best metric that show the impact of the sanctions. Um, yeah, I mean, if Russia's economy would collapse, you would see it in GDP figures, but it's not necessarily the best figure for um, measuring sanctions efficacy. Um, uh, it, it is certainly one, and, and you know, I don't think that we should um, excuse uh, our the assumptions because they did come from the highest levels of Western governments. You know, uh, President uh, Biden, you know, said it explicitly that yeah. he expected Russia's GDP to be crippled. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think that saying that oh, well, looking at other statistics should be used as an excuse to say, well, did they actually believe that it would do that? Did they really believe that it would mm. um, be a, a one-size-fits-all solution? Um, you know, how that got made at that uh, decision and how that was interpreted and briefed at that senior most level is obviously above my pay grade. Um, but, you know, I certainly have talked with a number of uh, officials and in, in sanctions authorities uh, and worked together with them in one way or another for, for many years, uh, whether that be in Europe, the United Kingdom, or the United States. Uh, and I don't think that that was the assumption of the actual sanctions policy policymakers mm. uh, themselves, um, and I'm happy to discuss this further if you want, but I do think there were real changes in our understanding of how sanctions worked in between 2014 and 2022. Mm. Mm. So it was maybe the expected outcome was lost in translation a little bit. Well, I think that sanctions were initially used against Russia um, as a tool to try to deter the Kremlin from further aggression. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to 2014, when the first sanctions were introduced, uh, again, the first major sanctions against Russia were introduced uh, by the West, the real sort of novel development was the implementation of what were called sectoral sanctions. 
First by the United States, and then uh, after the MH17 disaster, in which a flight from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur was shot down by Russian forces o- o- over eastern Ukraine, the European Union joined as well. But what these sanctions did was that they uh, limited investment for certain companies or, or for some Russian sectors, most notably um, fracking, offshore oil development, um, uh, and Western companies were barred from these. But also they included a notable tool to borrow to bar Russian companies from borrowing in Western capital markets that were affected. Um, and this was uh, caused a huge crisis for the Russian economy at the end of 2014 uh, with Rosneft, the Russian state oil company, uh, being bailed out uh, so that uh, it wouldn't be uh, affected by these sanctions, effectively forced into to a kind of bankruptcy. Um, the That greatly impoverished the Russian people. It's still the single largest uh, day collapse in the Russian ruble, except for the first day uh, um, after the war when markets went haywire, the full-scale invasion, I mean, uh, was this this effort to save um, Rosneft back in, in December of 2014. But um, I explained those to say that what the sanctions intended to do uh, was uh, to work as a deterrent tool, say, look at what this power we have, and mm. if you keep... Um, having further aggression into Crimea uh, and, and into other parts of Ukraine, we can ratchet these up. Uh, the sanctions were in turn ratcheted up in a relatively coherent way under the Obama administration, an entirely incoherent way under the Trump administration. And then again, once the Biden administration, uh, after the victory in the 2020 election, um, reinstituted from its early stages that sort of signaling, you do X, we will result with sanction Y um, policy. And now... In my opinion, and I certainly think the sort of political science and the history backs this up, sanctions are not necessarily so effective at convincing an adversary not to do something, mm-hmm. right? Uh, we've had sanctions. The United States has had sanctions on Cuba for uh, 70 years almost now. Uh, the Cuban government has not taken policies that the United States would like. They don't do that in uh, North Korea. Most recently in Iran, of course, in 2018, you know, the Trump administration uh, reimposed sanctions on uh, Tehran that had been uh, suspended under the 2015 uh, JCPOA or Iran deal. Um, and rather than the new maximum pressure policy, yes, it caused significant economic difficulties for Iran and Iranians, but uh, Iran is closer to having a nuclear weapon now than it ever was before, and they're widely believed to have sort of a uh, maybe one month breakout capacity. Um, so those sanctions actually pushed Iran even more to do the policy mm. that, that the West didn't want it to do. Where sanctions are very effective, and this gets to some of the points that we were talking about earlier, even if they're not a you know super weapon that can destroy the economy of a uh, UN Security Council major commodities power to um, state like Russia, uh, is sanctions are really effective as a tool of war by other means. Um, and this gets back to, uh, again, our sort of first discussions and where they go and why it's important. I think that the West can remain committed to this strategy. Um, but yes, they are a way of holding the Russian um, state uh, responsible for its action. They are uh, a way that the West can use um, its relative, the relative imbalance of power in its favor to hold Russia to account, to restrict it, to make it pay costs for its aggression uh, in Ukraine. Um, but they are not going to stop Russia from, or, or at least Putin from, um, waging that kind of conflict. It is possible, you know, in a more in a Russian system where there was more democratic accountability. Mm. Yes, I do think that that w- would be the case. Um, but uh, a lot of these sort of failures and failures to understand where sanctions work and where they don't work is also, uh, as well as the role of democratic states and non-democratic states in that equation, that led to a lot of the failures that we saw in European policymaking, in particular in Germany, um, where there was this sort of thought that, oh, the more we have economic interdependence with Russia, the less likely they will be to take major aggression. Um, And I think going back to that point about uh, Russian living standards not returning to their 2013 levels um, and Putin's level of security and power, um, unless the Russian economy is truly in, in... the major doldrums uh, and he can't 
continue to operate the relationships with the stakeholders uh, within the Kremlin and, and within his own government that he has often managed through economic incentives. Um, Putin is just uh, not going, I, I frankly don't think he cares um, mm. about uh, the average wealth of, of the average Russian. He cares about um, how great a power Russia is far more than that. He may think that wealth flows from that, and there's certainly an argument to be made there, um, uh, but I would argue his strategy there has been vastly um, under performing and and a colossal failure when you consider how easy he assumed it would be uh, for Russia to take over Ukraine entirely, uh, as well as um, the knock-on costs that that's had for Russia reputationally, economically, politically, and and so forth, uh, not only uh, in the West, but in the wider international community. Mm. You mentioned that one of the key aims of the sanctions is uh, to reduce the capability of Russia to wage war against Ukraine. Mm. Um, and I guess one of the san- agree- arguments against the sanctions is that it's uh, a question of to what extent that's working and to what extent we're actually able to cut off Russia from the technology and the equipment it needs because we might not be able to sell uh, those things to Russia directly, but Russia's able to buy it through um, third countries. And we have seen that uh, trade in countries like Kazakhstan um, with both Europe and Russia has uh, uh, increased exponentially since the war has started and sanctions have been implemented, which might suggest that um, the flow of goods is still there, but it might be just flowing through mm. other ways. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll sort of answer that in, in, in reverse. Yes, it is true that the Russian state has many, has found many effective ways to find imports of critical technologies uh, that have been restricted, uh, at least nominally under, for example, in the U.S., it's the Department of Commerce, uh, has a department called the Bureau of Industrial Security. They publish long lists of dual-use goods, restricted export uh, items, items for which you need an export license. Um, uh, and obviously that list for Russia has grown tremendously um, over the last 10 years. It was first, uh, some technologies were restricted in 2014. That list of technologies has been vastly expanded in 2022. Other sanctions imposing countries have similar restrictions. There are issues um, in... Uh, there are issues in finding uniformity between um, all of those lists. In some ways, that's because of uh, various countries looking to protect certain favored industries. Um, for example, let's let's use non-sanctions imposing countries, but sanctions that um, have key ties uh, with the West in Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, all of which have growing chip manufacturing industries, not the sort of highest tech t- chips that we see in Taiwan that are you know such a hub of um, U.S.-Chinese uh, competition, but the sort of day-to-day ones. Um, you know, they all are looking to grow those industries, have them develop and essentially copy the, t- the Taiwanese model and have it eventually be um, a, a, a major development sector um, for their countries as well. Um, they may license U.S. technology, for example, um, and the Uh, So for, say, a patent owned by a a, a chip manufacturer that happens to be um, based in the United States will then be actually manufactured in, you know, I I don't want to picture, pick on any one of the countries, but let's say the Philippines, Malaysia or or Indonesia. Um, It then gets sold on to the international market. Um, Let's say it gets sold to another one of those countries. Then that seller um, may get an inquiry saying ship it here and it ultimately ends up in Russia, right? It it becomes very unclear whose responsibility it lies Mm -hmm. with to ensure compliance uh, everywhere there. And even if the sort of company, the U.S. company's subsidiary or contracted partner in one of those countries has the agreement, uh, then once it's sold on, it can sort of say we've washed our hands of it. There have been, you know, certainly more egregious examples of companies in the United States and in Germany, for example, exporting machine tools that are very strictly banned from being sold to Russia. Um, so th- this is a, a, an issue in enforcement, not only globally, but in those markets as well. Uh, and then, of course, a lot of these technologies that we are talking about are relatively small. You know, the amount of sanctioned computer chips that you can fit in a, a backpack is very large. Mm. Um, so the sort of sanctions enforcement tools are very different 
from saying barring Russian companies from banks, in which case you can, you know, very clearly say to those banks, well, if you, you know, you report your loans and, yeah. you know, we audit you and if we see something coming to Russia or we catch you, you know, many banks have been sanctioned for, have been um, fined for, for sanctions infringements, you know, that, that, that can be done. Um, so, you know, I think it takes some time to, to really develop these uh, on uh, a major scale for a country as large as Russia. You know, a lot of these technology restrictions have existed with regard to um, North Korea in, in particular, but sort of the North Korean side... The size of North Korea as a player on the global market, or the effectiveness of its intelligence services, uh, ability to find ways around these is, is frankly a fraction of what it is compared to Russia, and that's something we also need to consider. Right? Is you know how much is Russia helping? North Korea now, as North Korea has uh, moved closer to Russia and started supplying it uh, artillery shells in recent months for use in the conflict in Ukraine. So, you know, these things have not only their sort of initial factors, but then secondary and third, um, knock-on costs. What I would say, uh, though, is... You know, that doesn't mean these sanctions don't serve a purpose, right? Of course, it costs the Kremlin a lot of time and money to come mm. up with these efforts to get around uh, sanctions. It is, in some ways, playing a game of whack-a-mole, um, which, you know, the game where, you know, you try to hit the mm -hmm. little thing that pops up and then another one pops up in another place. Um, and, um, you know, we, we it's a constantly learning process. There have just been a number of other recent arrests in uh, the United States about um, Russian nationals in, in involved in uh, alleged procurement networks violating sanctions. I talk in the book about uh, one of my favorite um, cases in which a... Uh a Russian politician's son um, had been running a network to import U.S. technology to, uh, that was sanctioned to Russia even pre-2022 using German companies to do so. Um, uh, ultimately found himself actually arrested in Italy on a U.S. Uh, facing uh, extradition to the United States and then um, was uh, incredulously allowed to go on house arrest and then was spirited out uh, of the country. He has since sort of bragged that the Russian intelligence Intelligence services were involved. They didn't say it explicitly, but uh, that was, you know, very clear that, that the, at least to me, that that was the intended mm. message thereof. Um, so, you know, this is a, a, a um, but but that whole operation, everything cost the Kremlin a lot and took it a lot of time. It's now been disrupted, and we can take the lessons to go on to the next one. Do I think it is possible to say that in a dream scenario, not a single sanctioned computer chip um, will get into Russia? No, I think that's pretty unrealistic. Hmm. Uh, we can have better hopes with machine tools, you know, very large instruments, often bigger than, than the size of this table that we're sat at, uh, um, uh, and others, yes, but the idea that... Um, uh, it will be perfect, no, but that doesn't mean it isn't worth doing it and, and that it shouldn't be a part of the program, right? If we just didn't impose these sanctions on it and Russia was out there um, l legitimately buying up, you know, tons of computer chips to, to use in missiles around the world, not only would that have an impact on that market and uh, shift manufacturers maybe to be less inclined to take up, um, uh, take heed of, of the Western interest, um, uh, but also it, it would be a lot cheaper for the Kremlin to continue to manufacture those missiles and uh, if you know it, it may be impossible to say that uh, and, and Russian missile production was impacted in the you know sort of six to twelve months after the war began uh, it appears based on contacts I, I speak with who, who researchers who are focused much more in the defense sector than I am they tell me they believe missile production is now uh, at about if not maybe even slightly in excess of its pre-war level um, but right that doesn't mean that, that we should assume well if these hadn't happened then mm. Russian missile production might have been double or triple mm. um, Mm -hmm. um, and that we shouldn't continue to refine these tools to get it to fall by 10, 15, 20, whatever percent um, it, 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 it may be in the future. So um, even where there hasn't been a headline change sort of year over year or, two year, or year over two years, um, uh, that doesn't mean that, that these uh, restrictions and tools haven't um, caused costs to, to the Russian state and therefore brought benefits to Ukraine and, and the Western interest. Right. Uh, so I think I'd like to move on away from the sanctions and a little bit uh, more to towards the uh, future outlook and what can we expect. And you've mentioned that even though Russia is the terminally ill patient, it can theoretically go on like this indefinitely. And I think that's sort of hard to understand for a lot of people. And I was wondering if you could just explain how that can be possible, given uh, the impact of sanctions and given how incredibly expensive it is for Russia to wage the war of this in intensity. 
Um, and uh, given the fact that Russia has a GDP the size of Italy, mm. um, how come uh, it's able to continue doing that for um, uh, basically the foreseeable future? Sure. Um, so let's look at the cost of uh, putting a battalion from Italy uh, on the battlefield somewhere, say, you know, today would largely be a, a peacekeeping mission somewhere um, versus a, a, a Russian battalion. Um, you know, it, Italy has some mandatory military service for, for males, far less than Russia, um, far smaller standing army. The um, Russian government has the willingness, ability, uh, and threat of instituting conscription and drafts. They already did so last year. Um, I would expect that at some point, uh, maybe early next year, um, they will do so again. Um, of course, there's the annual conscription process that goes mm. on in Russia anyway, and Russia has expanded the uh, eligibility uh, requirements for that. Um, and then there is the cost of a Russian tank uh, versus an Italian tank or, or, or the, the tank that Italy buys from uh, other Western countries. Um, again, for the Russian state, is, is, is less than 20% of, of the cost of uh, that for the Italian one. Um and then there's, of course, the political willingness to, right? The Italian government has to uh, respond to, uh, or, or any other Western government has to respond to its own electorate for the costs of uh, deciding to commit to a war earlier uh, anywhere, and then, of course, uh, be held accountable um, for the costs of that war, both in material and, and, and most importantly, in, in lives. Uh, the Russian state isn't oblivious to the um, social ramifications of, of the war, uh, but its cost of maintaining them um, is far lower, right? The, the Russian government under Putin has spent 20 years creating this narrative, um, one that builds on previous Soviet narratives as well. Of course, that's sort of the most... On, uh, honorable thing one can do is go and fight for, for one's fa fatherland, and of course, uh, then the inverse, that it's a great dishonor not to. Um, and then it selectively drafts and enlists people from um, more economically um, depressed areas of Russia, right? So the rate of conscription in, in uh, Dagestan, there's some of the other... Um, uh, nominally autonomous republics in the North Caucasus is far higher than it is in, in Moscow or, mm. or St. Petersburg. Um, there was a Russian sociologist last year who wrote a very good article for the Moscow Times. Uh, uh, I believe it was called The Three Russias. If, if you're interested, um, your listeners, uh, I, I would strongly recommend reading it. And he said, uh, well, firstly, if you're reading this article and you're Russian, uh, you're from, uh, because it's in English, you're from the first Russia. Um, the sort of Russia of international travel of Moscow, St. Petersburg, Sochi, a few other cities. There's the second Russia of um, the uh, regions in, in, in places where where, um, you know, yes, there are regional capitals, but the sort of core industries of those regional capitals are usually in the commodity sector in one way or another, um, sometimes in the arms sector, um, but are basically the same ones that they were even in the Soviet times. Uh, oftentimes they're monotowns or cities like Magnitogorsk that were literally stood up by the Soviet Union. And then you have the third Russia of the Russia of the uh, sort of ethnic republics and regions, um, which are very different from how they were with the Union republics in the Soviet Union in that almost only a handful of of them almost entirely in the North Caucasus um, uh, have titular uh, have a majority of their their titular population, right? So in Chechnya, yes, the majority mm. of, of uh, people are ethnic Chechens, but uh, if you take the Tuva Republic in in, in um, eastern Russia, uh, the, the majority of people um, are ethnic Russians. Uh, same in Kalmykia, Buryatia, m m many other um, Russian nominal regions. But he does sort of differentiate those by saying, um, you know. Uh, reflecting on their own relationship to the war and their potential for being drafted and potential to have threats with disagree and uh, disagreements with Moscow is higher than that second Russia. Um, now, the first Russia has been impacted in terms of th those individuals can't travel uh, as easily anymore. It's very difficult to go between Russia uh, and the European Union, for example, now, even with the visa restrictions, the Czech Republic, for example, of course, has, has barred most Russians from visas, but also with flight restrictions and sanctions there, one essentially has to fly to Serbia or to uh, the UAE or Turkey and then take a connecting flight. Um, but that doesn't mean even when I, I, I went to 
a friend's birthday in the south of France uh, this year, right? And the flight um, that I saw from there was still it was from uh, Nice to. Um, uh, n- not Istanbul, I forget which city in Turkey it was, um, but another Turkish city. And Ankara? all the passengers, it might have been Ankara. Um, I, I, I just can't remember. Um, but but um, you know, all the passengers were Russians mm. sort of doing that, that uh, transit flight. Um, the uh, first Russia has been infected that way, but their sort of voices and their ability to actually speak out, whether they may not all you know, agree with them, but certainly once upon a time were the oligarchic class. They've been politically neutered by uh, Putin. They haven't felt the cost, at least directly to their families, as much in the same way as the second and third Russia. Uh, the third Russia... Um, has really felt the cost, and we may be seeing some of the impacts of that with a few protests in uh, various parts of the Caucasus, but uh, a lot of that is controlled by Putin, who still has the ability to hand out enough um, riches to... to Mm. Regional strongman Ramzan Kadyrov, the Chechen strongman, is probably the best example uh, to be able to control that. And then in the second Russia, the, he's really used the propaganda tools in those narratives where um, you know a lot of those people. Yes, the young ones are more likely to get um, some news uh, online, but still are far more likely to trust state media and television as sources than um, millennials and Gen Zs, so to speak. Of of uh, other European countries um, or, or Western countries. Um, so, you know, Putin has, has engineered his system to really be able to deal with the threats from um, those three different broad classifications of Russian society. Uh, and where exactly the imbalance comes and the like is where he will face, you know, potential um, risks to his regime. This is somewhere where... Personally, my opinions have really shifted a lot over the last year and a half, and um, you know, it's it's not sort of something I focus on in the book. And I think there are, are much better um, sociologists and and uh, analysts of. Russian politics, if I can briefly um, uh, mention some, I'd, I'd strongly recommend Ben Noble, who is the uh, editor of my book and who, who wrote uh, a book uh, about Alexei Navalny uh, and has really studied sort of political developments both within the sis- Russian system, but as well as uh, um, outside the system of the Kremlin's rule, um, as well as uh, sociologists and, and uh, analysts of, of sort of global trends in history. Um, Jeremy Morris, uh, a professor in Denmark, um, um, comes to mind in particular, done a lot of really good field work mm. um, um, across these sort of three Russias. Uh, and I think through reading and engaging with their work, for example, my opinion has shifted in part ways. It comes from I became interested in Russia as a Russophile, right? It wasn't um, that I first started studying Russia and the region because um, sanctions were what I saw as the future. Uh, it was because I had many close friends from Russia, Ukraine, Georgia, Uzbekistan, friends I went to school with um, uh, and, and was fascinated by it. And saw it as a place that we actually, as Westerners broadly, did have a lot in common. Um, and of course, then studying Russian history, two of the most important historical moments in the last hundred years or 120 years have, have come from the, the the Russians, or a little over 100 years, 105 years, um, have come from uh, Russia, right? First, the idealism of the Bolshevik Revolution and communism and, and the change that that had uh, on the world. Um, and then, of course, the decision to ultimately uh, undo the impacts of their revolution and to tear down the Soviet Union was one that, of course, you know, came about as a result of um, centrifugal trends in the Union republics, in places like Georgia and the Balkans, uh, the Baltic countries, um, but which ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, really the Soviet Union collapsed in the initially peaceful way it did um, because of the Russian people saying, "No, we will, you know, back Yeltsin, we will back Gorbachev against the Putschists," um, uh, and then effectively to themselves want to dismantle that empire. Um, so, you know, for a long time, I would say to my Russian friends, um, or, or Russian friends in particular here in the diaspora, m- many of whom um, you know, are against the war uh, and adamantly so you know i would say to them oh well you know i still believe in the russian people's ability to drive historical change Mm. and they would be the ones sort of laughing at me and saying you know you idealist um and it's not that i don't believe in in the potential of the russian people to affect that kind of change but because i think i underestimated the kremlin's um understanding of how to keep the that genie in the bottle and how to push it down um 
and where I do think it's more likely that threats to the Putin system will come from, um, and I certainly started saying this before, but uh, certainly the Prigozhin putsch that we saw this summer, um, you know, just a few weeks after the book came out, um, uh, that did really cause me to... um, think, okay, you know, even if Prigozhin isn't the one, and I, I'm not necessarily sure that I ever thought it was likely that he would be able to generate some kind of mass movement or anything, but that his actions are representative of the no longer tenable position within Putin's own elite and his allies amongst him themselves. So I don't know what it will be that causes change there, but you know, right now compared to a year ago, if if you ask me to say where do I think it is more likely that real fractures will emerge within the Putin system, I would say it's within the elites um than uh it, it is on the street. Um that you know, uh, but again, we have to understand those elites properly and when I talk about them here, I mean the ones who are Putin loyalists who came up under his system, who've benefited from how he's redistributed assets uh and and managed system, not necessarily the oligarchs of the 1990s, who, um, you know, were sort of in many ways the poster boys of the sanctions regime initially, one for their previous opulence, you know, Roman Abramovich, his ownership of Chelsea mm. and, and um, sort of public um, image is, is, is something far more Westerners uh, know about than, say, the relationship between um, uh, various Russian policymakers, Sergei Glaziev, uh, Avira Nabilina, central bank head. Had Igor Sechin, the head of Rosneft, and their opinions on how the Russian government should be managing its economy. But those are the ones where tensions amongst that group are far more likely to matter than tensions amongst that historical sort of oligarchic class of the 1990s. Uh, although many of them did, of course, you know, enable um, Putin's rise to power, including one who he famously fell out with, Boris Berezovsky, in a long history in, in, in the West uh, after he went into exile, uh, relatively well known. Um, but Certainly since the mid-2000s, Putin has displaced their political power entirely. Uh, I don't think anybody from within his own elite circle has necessarily the um, uh, ability to, you know, push him out or something sort of so black and white. Um, But I do, you know, wonder how much discussions have changed in that group and how much more tensions could cause reverberations um, throughout uh, the wider Kremlin system. With those tensions, if they actually exist, would they have economic reasons as well? Because I assume that as there is less uh, resources to go around, um, uh, the competition might get more intense. And I guess even for Prigozhin and his uh, failed uh, coup attempt or whatever it was, yeah. the, there was a strong economic incentive in what he attempted to do. You know, I th- I think that, Yes, there is definitely an economic role there. I mean, one of the sort of um, predictions that I make broadly about the Russian economy over the next few years is that um, except for where it's useful for sanctions evasion and stuff like that, you know, Russia has sort of 10 very large mining companies, Mm. uh, two huge oil companies, a number of other smaller ones, um, uh, a few gas companies. Yes, there's a key difference between Novatech, which sells most of the LNG in Gazprom, and that may remain because of um, both interests within Putin's own circle and within evading sanctions. But overall, the amount of actual decision makers, even if not actual corporates, is being whittled down. Um, and I do think that that, you know, Luke Oil, for example, their management and, and, and the like, um, the chief businessman oligarch in, in charge there, Vagit Lekparov, stepped down after he was sanctioned from his normal role in, in 2022, still holds a share, uh, has given much over to his children as well in sort of sanctions mitigation efforts. Um, but overall, I don't think he's been calling the shots or the other members of the Luke Oil board for their strategy for a long time now. And it's Igor Sechin who nominally heads the rival company, Rosneft, and, and its parent structure. But really, he's the guy who determines everything, in my opinion, um, that happens in the Russian oil sector now. So yes, uh, th- there will be tensions that emerge directly over that, you know, basically squabbling over a smaller pie, especially when, whether it be the natural causes or time or health or whatever it is, you know, there, there are changes of those key um, individuals there, uh, you know, but I'll give you one thing, and this is where I, I definitely differ from a lot of people, Um But I also think that in part there's a recognition that this is a war that 
Putin wanted um, more than anyone else, even the hawks within the Russian elite wanted. So, you know, you have, for example, Dmitry Medvedev, his sort of caretaker president between 2008 and 2012, um, when Putin was nominally not you know, taken out of the presidency as he um, was term limited from running again and then had the constitution changed so he could run again and now essentially indefinitely. Uh uh, a close ally of his, a business partner, uh, both political and business partner of his, going back to the 1990s in, in St. Petersburg, uh, where, where they both worked in the, in, in the mayor's office and, and remained close since then. Um, but Medvedev was seen, if you, you know, go back and read sources from the time, and you know his famous trip to the United States where he got burgers with Barack Obama and went to Silicon Valley. Um, you know, he, he was sort of seen or, or, or portrayed as the um, moderate, liberal reformer he is now turned into the guy who you know occasionally you'll read stuff in the news or on social media about sort of barking mad statements from a russian official calling for nuking whatever the or, unhinged tweets yeah exactly you know and lots of jokes about him writing them after many glasses of vodka at night um you know what I would to get back to my point though with him and, and, and others like him, you know, broadly, if you are a historian of the Soviet Union or have read a lot about it, you'll know that you know obviously you had actual different titles for different leaders of the Soviet Union, right? So Lenin had a different title from Khrushchev, from Gorbachev, uh, so on and so forth. Usually after Stalin, the sort of general secretary was was the main one, um, but then you had the Politburo of of uh, the the Communist Party. Um, you have a, a similar um, um, bureau in, in Communist China today. The closest Russia has to that today of sort of the decision-making certain around Putin is his security council. Mm. Um, and many of whom are allies of his uh, from the security services and backgrounds there, some even going back to before uh, the Soviet collapse, but many of whom are also like Medvedev individuals from the 1990s. Um, and to get to my point, this is where I differ from a lot of people. I do think that if Putin were hit by a lightning strike tomorrow or tripped and fell in his bathroom as some you know horrible British tabloids were claiming without evidence this weekend, uh, but if that really did happen, even if it was Medvedev or whoever else on the Security Council sort of rose to the fore um, to replace him, I very strongly believe that one of the things that they would do, if not initially, but certainly not long thereafter, would be to throw Putin under the bus. Mm -hmm. uh, the same way, or in a similar way to how um, uh, Khrushchev, the Soviet leader um, who cemented power after Stalin, after a few years gave his famous secret speech, sort of uh, began the de-Stalinization process, um, uh, I think that they would say Putin was a traitor to the Russian people um, because the reality is, is, you know, Putin had this uh, infamous article he wrote you know, not long before the full scale invasion about the historical unity of the Russian Ukrainian peoples um, as somebody of German and, and Austrian background family living on both sides. You know, I always say, well, you know, even if we take all those points to be true, like it totally doesn't matter that, you know, uh, whether my family is still my family, who cares if they live in Germany or Austria. Right. And uh, of course, the idea of the European Union is even greater example of that and, and sort of this move away from nationalism. Um, but, you know, having spent a lot of time in southern and eastern Ukraine, the areas that are tragically now affected by this war, yes, I went around, I, I speak somewhat decent Russian, I don't speak Ukrainian. Um, I was able to use that. There are, uh, I've made the argument before that Putin is the true father of Ukrainian nationalism. It wasn't Zelensky, it wasn't uh, Khmelnytsky, famous uh, Cossack leader, it wasn't um, certainly the leaders of the Ukrainian nationalist movement who Putin and likes to, vil to vilify, in often cases rightfully so, of, of the Second World War era um, or the leaders of, of Ukraine in the initial years after the Soviet collapse. It's really Putin who solidified that Ukrainian national uh, image and cohesion and uh, ha has lost it, I think, forever for, for Russia. Um, and so I think for many of the same reasons that these people actually agree with Putin's beliefs about that stuff uh, are the very same reasons that they will eventually throw him under the bus to legitimize themselves um, in, in the future even those who are closest to him. So, no, I can't sit here and claim any foresight that Putin will be hit by a lightning strike tomorrow or um, uh, slip and fall in his bathroom. Um, but uh, maybe it's because my nature is to be optimistic, but that's one... Uh, 
I guess prognostication is the wrong word because it relies on a certain series of events. But um, if that uh, Putin were, were to meet that fate, I would go to the betting shop here in London and say, how much uh, uh, will you put on for the next Russian leader within five years calling Putin a traitor on national television and uh, see what odds they'd give me? And I'd probably take that bet. I've heard a theory that um, the it's only someone who comes after Putin who will be able to... Um, end the war with Ukraine in some way because it will, unlike with Putin, it will not be their war anymore. Uh, you know, I do think that um, Putin has essentially staked his legitimacy uh, on it. Um, you know, Putin's control of the Russian media environment, ecosystem, and, and various political levers over those three Russias, as we talked about earlier, Um I think if Putin decide, you know, woke up one morning and said, "Wow, what a mistake I've made," um, you know, he could over uh, the next months, year, create the environment for ending the war on his own. Uh, yes, that would lead to a backlash from some Russian nationalist and 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 other uh, fringe uh, or previously fringe, which have now been mainstreamed as a result of this war, um, uh, sectors of society. Um, so I'm not saying that it would be smooth, but. Um, uh, uh, I don't think we can say that, you know, th that sort of frame is an environment for um, thinking about in terms of negotiations, right? That, oh, you know, we have to mm. give Putin some kind of victory because he can't actually end this war. No, I, you know, we can, Putin can use his media and social control um, over the Russian state to... Uh, sell victory as uh, sell defeat as victory right he's already doing that mm. um with with, with, uh, uh, with, with the setbacks that, that the russian army has faced in ukraine um so uh yeah i i i think that it is possible that he would do so but you know the real clean break and and, and acknowledgement ever that you know the ukrainian invasion w was a mistake um uh you know even that is highly unlikely and i'm reminded of um a speech george bush former george w bush the second bush president uh gave um a, a little while uh, after the the full-scale invasion last year where uh in a uh, remarkably almost freudian slip of the tongue, he said, well, you know, this uh, unprovoked uh, unilateral invasion of Iraq, and I, I, I mean Ukraine. Uh, that's maybe the closest that George Bush has ever come to apologizing uh, for the Iraq war. Uh, he did so in a laughing manner that, um, you know, for me as an American who grew up about it and, and, and didn't have immediately fa family affected by by the war um, can can be funny, but I don't think that that's a, a funny thing if you're an Iraqi, right? Um, and uh, certainly even sort of that level of being able to, you know, that will never happen from Putin. He, he will never say you know, even a free, and, and, you know, the Freudian, I, I don't think subconsciously he can ever, believe, you know, uh, I, I don't, you know, there are some people who have said, oh, you know, Putin must realize what a mistake he's made. Um, I think because of his sort of paranoid, um, way of operating and fixation that Russia has to be this great power regardless of, of whether economically it is so uh, or, or not um, because of his, his view of Russia's rightful place in history and, and um, uh, you know, Putin's <laughs> almost grievance politics, you know, Putin is, 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 is uh, shares much in common with those who are derided as woke in that sense. He has a lot of grievance politics. Um, uh, I, I don't think that will allow him subconsciously to even admit to himself that this was a, a, a huge failure. If we take a s step back for a little bit and look at more of the global context of w what's happening. Um, one thing that Putin is really trying to do, and he has been trying to do that for a while, but it has intensified after the invasion of Ukraine, is to sort of remodel the uh, uh, global, um, both political and economic model of the world. And he's trying to, um, at least in rhetorically, uh, present the world as now being run by the uh, Russia, China, and um, other non-Western countries, um, uh, in particular the BRICS group of countries. And I'm wondering to what extent this is actually a reality, something that we should 
uh, take seriously and 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 take in account for the future and to what extent it's just a dream that Russia and m- maybe China have but that's very far away from actually uh, uh, being a reality sure um, so once again I'll sort of answer it in, in, in reverse starting with Russia and China and then getting on to the systemic factors um, a few weeks at the beginning of uh, the beginning of February in 2020 to just a few weeks before Putin launched this full-scale invasion, there was this famous declaration of between Putin and Xi of um, uh, you know limitless friendship uh, between Russia and and, and China. Um, certainly, the, that was how it was described in Russian, and, and my understanding from China scholars is uh, similar language was used in Chinese as well. Um, I think that this war has proven to, that uh, it is very much a, a acquaintanceship with um, uh, limits. Um, uh, even uh, friends with benefits is, isn't uh, how I would describe it, um, which is Russia does not have the economic clout and global power that China does, and is uh, almost an, is even more dependent now on China uh, for uh, its commodity sales than it ever was before. Um, the shift in power uh, between that partnership, friendship, whatever you want to call it, has always, or for certainly Putin's entire time in power, been in China's favor. It has shifted even more so lately. Putin wants three things from Beijing. Um, uh, right now. One, we already spoke about the loans. He wants loans and access to China's capital market, use of its currency, uh, inter- internationalization. Yes, he's gotten some more loans, but overall the sort of idea that they could replace the West and or, or that even um, Russia can fully trust the Chinese um, economic system and, and Yuan have not come to pass and are very unlikely to come mm. to pass, even as loans probably are going to grow uh, another decent amount this year. Second thing he wants is direct military uh, support. Um, China hasn't denounced the war in the same ways, has, however, participated in some of the peace conferences based on Zelensky's proposals, has not um, uh, given Russia direct military aid. Yes, you know, there's some lots of buying of r- Chinese drones by Russians to uh, be used in the conflict, helmets, uh, a few other uh, instances where uh, things have been shipped, but right, we haven't seen uh, in the same way the West has supplied Ukraine with tanks and helped repair them, a- anything like that mm. from, from China. Uh, third thing that um, Putin wants from China is a deal on the power of Siberia 2 pipeline, which is actually one of the things they were meeting about in that meeting at the beginning of February. Uh, power of Siberia 1 was agreed less than six months after the first invasion of Ukraine in uh, February of 2014. Um, done, yes, uh, you know, the contract isn't public, but it was widely messaged by China that they'd gotten a great deal on this and a Russian state to agree to discounts again showing the relative imbalance of power this time China's just basically made wait and put, make Putin wait for more than 18 months do I think the power of Siberia to eventually will be agreed and just uh, to explain the power yeah. of Siberia to is there's a, a pipeline. gas pipeline running from Russia to China um, so there's already one power of Siberia one and, and then they hope to build a, a, a second one that, that will um, double uh, slightly more than double the, the the current capacity would still mean that even if power of Siberia 2 is constructed, the total piped capacity of China to buy Russian gas would still be below what it was for Europe before 2022, right? But it would it would be close. Um, uh, the um, so you know the the it remains to be seen. I do expect that eventually that that pipeline will get agreed and and, and built, but even on more advantage, advantageous terms to, to China. Uh, and of course, right now with the Chinese economy appearing slow and that uh, impacting gas demand, China is more than happy to, to wait, especially because that kind of step would piss off the Western authorities at, at this moment, at the same time as China's quietly, in my view, trying to sort of lower tensions um, there. Uh, so, you know, that's the China bit. Then there's the wider BRICS bit, which is that, of course, BRICS isn't an alliance and it's not even a formal organization, right? There is a BRICS bank, the New Development Bank, as it's since been renamed. It was also stood up after 2014, 2015. Um, 
uh, it has suspended its loans in Russia, not only the issuance of new loans, but the issuance of loans that it already agreed, precisely because the power uh, of Western sanctions and the fact that if it comes to, to violate those, um, uh, whether that be through sort of the actual plumbing of things and Russian banks losing their ability to easily send money in, in and out of the country, um, uh, or in this case, my you know a bigger issue being, well, we don't want ourselves to be sanctioned by the United States or, or, or the European Union. Um uh, so, you know, um, there the real sort of fundamental idea that Putin has, as we were talking about with the BRICS summit earlier, is to create this uh, alternate currency and to replace the dollar. Um, you know, I view that China does have a long term interest in that, but not anytime soon, especially while it's the world's largest holder of dollar assets. Um you know, that's why I use the term economic war in the book to differentiate, say, from the trade wars we've seen between the West mm. and China over the last six years. I think China, and this is the reason why I think it's sort of hesitant um, to support um, Russia in those three areas we spoke about just now, um, is I think China wants to replace the United States of the key node of the international economic order, uh, whereas Russia wants to destroy the international economic mm. order. What we need to keep in mind as Western analysts and policymakers is, okay, at what point does China China potentially um, decide that it sees Russia's actions as more of an opportunity to advance its interests than its threats. Uh, right now, I think they still see it as more of a threat. I think the other BRICS countries see it as even more of a threat, right? So although India has dramatically increased its purchases of Russian oil because it's cheap and sanctioned and and, and they have that ability, um, uh, you know, they still haven't agreed with Russia the currency swap system that they want. So Russia's basically left with a whole bunch of rupees that they can't use for anything other than buying Indian products. And the Indians are perfectly fine with that because India, like China, has a closed um, capital market and, and Russia does effectively now, too. Um, you know, that's the sort of real secret sauce in the Western international economic order is the benefit of having these um, open capital markets with one another, right? If you want to move, uh, whether it's as a business um, or as an individual, um, money from the United States to Germany, to the Czech Republic, to Singapore, to um, uh, Bermuda, ultimately, the end of the day, you're not, you don't need government permission anywhere to do that, right? You do need government permission in China to take uh, amounts over $20,000, $50,000 out of the country, same in Russia, you need government paperwork, sign off. The real point of all this is, is that then when there's a crisis, right, so whether it was the um, global financial crisis 2008, 2009, whether it was COVID, uh, whether it was most recently in the day after um, Hamas's terrorist attack in Israel, uh, what happens is people go to the safety asset of last resort, which despite the craziness of U.S. politics is the U.S. dollar. Um for a BRICS currency or an alternate system to really be an effective market. One, they would need a deficit market so that they could invest all the excess capital that the countries like Russia, China, um, uh, India, uh, Brazil earn as commodities and, and, and exporters. What I mean is they have you know, um, trade balances in their favor, right? They, they have a, a, an export surplus and export more than they import. The opposite problem uh, that we have in the United States and, and, and uh, across uh, most of Europe. Um, so, that, you know, when that happens, you need somewhere to go park that money and you want to go park it in a safe space where you can earn your return, you can move your money in and out. So that's why China and Japan, despite having, you know, both very opposite geopolitical relationships to the United States to the number one and number two holders of, of U.S. treasuries and other uh, U.S. dollar assets. Um, and uh, put simply, the BRICS countries don't trust each other enough and they lack the kind of capital market like that to, to pursue that alternative. Um, so, you know, I think this is one of the reasons why they really need to get Europe and the United States' relationship to break, to have that deficit market, to go to mm -hmm. uh, um, in one or the other to make this kind of alternative possible. What I would say is... You know, the, the framework that we have of people saying, oh, the dollar's share of international trade or international reserves did this and did that over the last year. Well, firstly, actually, the dollar share of international trade and reserves uh, and borrowing, which in my opinion is the most important one, uh, actually went up in 2022, despite the introduction of the most stringent sanction system ever. So this sort of idea that, oh, maybe sanctions will make people no longer comfortable with um, uh, the Western markets, I think is complete nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think the data shows otherwise. Um, the, um, you know, 
reality is, is, is yes, China is building up its own institutions. The yuan is internationalizing, growing share of IMF reserves um, used in some swap arrangements. We've now seen most recently China loaning to Argentina directly in yuan. Um, uh, even though historically, for example, the Belt and Road itself has mostly been loans issued in dollars. Um, so, you know, I think China has a long term strategy to become that keynote and to replace it. Uh, what I um, think is that, you know, uh, I'll quote uh, Hemingway, right? He has a great line um, uh, gradually and then all at once. Um, China's threat is one that has to build very, very gradually as they build alternate systems. And then the change won't come from, it will not be, you know, the dollar goes down 2% every year for the next 20 years as a share of international trade. It may go down some years, it may go up some years, it's broad tread maybe slightly downwards, but that remains to be seen. When the change will happen, uh, it will be when there's a global crisis and then everybody in Instead of moving their dollars into uh, into dollars as the reserve asset, will go into something else. Um, and right now, I'm not saying it isn't a threat, and I certainly think it's something the U.S. in particular needs to keep in mind when we have our ridiculous debt ceiling and government um, shutdown debates. Right, the next government shutdown is now due in 15 days if they don't pass an agreement, including on Ukraine funding, uh, or that may be one of the key sticking issues. Um, we'll probably have another um, debt ceiling. Shut down next year or, 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 or debt ceiling standoff next year uh, between Democrats and Republicans, um, or at least uh, after the, the presidential election. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the risks to that system from within the West, in particular within the United States, from misunderstanding it are great. Um, but the actual idea that China, Russia, or the BRICS more broadly have built up an alternative uh, or effective alternative is um, uh, very, very premature. Hmm. One more question on China. Um, we quite often talk about what, that China is looking at the conflict or the war in Ukraine, and it's probably taking a lot of lessons away from it. Mm. I was wondering if we talk about the economic aspect of it. If you were Xi Jinping um, and you would potentially be planning to uh, put Taiwan under its control, whether it's through military invasion or some other means, what would be your takeaway in what Russia has tried to do in Ukraine? Sure. So, uh, you know, I caveat this with the fact that obviously I've studied Russia and, and, and Russian politics and economics for most of my life at this point now. Um, I, I do not speak Chinese. I'm not a China knower. You know, I, I, I don't claim the same level of insights. And of course, my view of looking at things through a Russia lens provides me with a certain bias. Mm. Um, so, you know, I tend to look at China and say, well, every time the Russians do something really stupid, like launching this full scale invasion of Ukraine, Beijing tends to look and say, let's not do that. Um, now, I do talk to China scholars, who, who are people who have a lot better understanding of what's gone on in Hong Kong and the like, uh, or certainly in Xinjiang. Where, where there have been real devastating human rights abuses and, and, and ones that deserve far more international attention, in my opinion. Um, but I don't worry quite as much about Beijing um, launching a major invasion of Taiwan uh, anytime soon, unless Xi feels that he's really threatened at power at home, um, in which case maybe he would, but... I'm not the right person to say whether he believes that he is threatened at power at home. Through speaking with others, I think that his concern about that is growing and that it will with um, uh, the potential economic slowdown, and maybe that's why he's looking to lower tensions with the U.S. at the moment. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I don't want to say that those are my own opinions. They're, they're ones, you know, formed by speaking to people who, who have uh, better insight um, in my view. So, you know, I don't think it's something um, we should forget and worry about. What I would say is in terms of sort of this kind of economic war uh, between uh, China and, and the West is, um, you know, the, the West's balance of power in the economic fight compared to Russia's is um, greatly stacked in its favor, right? Russia does issue its own sanctions. Some friends of mine have been sanctioned by Russia, so they can't travel to Russia anymore. But other than that, it doesn't make a difference. If you've been sanctioned by Russia, even if you are a literal billionaire, as we've seen many times, you cannot, you know, as, as we saw um, uh, Michael Friedman, one of the billionaires who was sanctioned here in London, owned the, one of the largest houses in, in all of London, Wittenhurst, and, uh, you know, was affected by he was complaining he couldn't even pay for a normal cab, right? So the, the power of Russian sanctions to, to do anything like that are are, are, are zero, let alone the sort of systemic factors um, that we talked about earlier. China does have the ability to effectively have a 
in terms of economic war with um, the United States and, and, and the West, uh, I do think there's sort of mutually assured destruction, right? So, you know, you have this idea that, um, you know, that gets spoken about occasionally, well, if China dumped all its U.S. treasuries, then, you know, the U.S. would be uh, in, in, in a very... Um, uh, I won't mm. use the language because it's a family podcast. Precarious um, but position. Yeah, precarious is a nice way to put it. Um, uh, the uh, But, you know, the reality is, is if China did that, China would also be in a very precarious uh, position, right? Because the U.S. dollar assets underpin the core of its own banking um, networks and uh, and structures. So, um, you know, I think there's much more of a situation of uh, mutually assured economic destruction. Um, of course, you know, again, one difference, as with Russia, that we have to keep in mind with China, too, is, you know, public responsiveness to these issues. In mm. the West, there's, there's just a lot more ability for them to matter at the ballot box than there is in a country like Russia or China. Um, but, um, yeah, I think uh, I tend to think that therefore, you know, I'm I, I don't want to sound too dovish on China and say that there aren't real concerns there from everything with intellectual property to, as said, its treatment of its own citizens in Xinjiang, its crackdown in Hong Kong, its threats against uh, Taiwan. Um, but, uh, you know, China is a long term uh, competitor that, you know, actually when you think about things from sort of an international systems perspective, right, um, a uh, hegemony is, you know, arguably, you know, certainly Francis Fukuyama and others argued we saw the United States had in the 90s um, versus a, is, is a stable one, as is a system with two great powers, you know, the U.S. And, and the Soviet Union. The pushback on that usually is, yeah, it was stable for those powers, but of course they fought a lot of proxy conflicts everywhere. Um, we're already seeing you know, effective proxy conflicts, if not hot ones, so much as economic ones uh, between the U.S. and China all over the world. Um, uh, but I do think that, you know, th there is a way to have a system in which there's competition with China without um, violence and destruction, whereas Russia, because of how it is positioned as a revanchist power that cannot hope to rise to true, you know, despite what Putin says, um, maybe in his darkest thoughts, you know, I, I think he actually would believe that it, it's not about raising Russia to great power status of the kind that the U.S. and, and China, the U.S. has and that China is close to having, or maybe some would argue already has, but it's rather about bringing everybody else down a notch, right? So that then everybody else is a lesser power and Russia is then a, a great power as a result. Um, and, um, you know, yeah, I, I, I think I'll leave it there that because of my views on Russia and because of my analysis and understanding of that, uh, I end up more dovish on uh, China, but in terms of direct policy prescriptions my biggest one is to say look we have to better understand this mutual assured economic destruction and how that fits into a power into a um, both hegemonic and two power world um, and even potentially in, in the event Russia does succeed um, and, and make it a, a much more multipolar world um, but my concern sort of for the immediate threats to the West is very much on Russia and particular in the U.S. debate we hear right now. You know, there's a lot of, I think, at best sophomoric, more likely pure the ignorant discussion, particularly on the Republican side, saying, oh, well, you know, we, you know, we have to make a deal with Russia so that they break with China and that they support us against China and so on and so forth. I'm far more worried about pushing China into Russia's camp than uh, Russia getting put, pushed more into China's camp, so to speak. Well, there was much needed optimism. Um, <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Okay. And I think... We we talked a lot about sort of the the sanctions and w which is in a way the Western uh, economic war against Russia. Mm. Um, so I'd like to talk a, a little bit about the Russian economic war against the West, and I guess the Russia's options in this way are a lot lot more limited, which you've mentioned than the other way around. But there was one big card that they had, um, which was the uh, energy. And mm. in particular, the fact that Europe was basically completely energetically uh, dependent on Russia. And if we look at summer of 2022 and, and a year ago, um, in, in the fall of 2022, there was a lot of panic mm. about uh, what happens if Russia cuts off um, um mainly gas yeah. and its flow to Europe. And Russia basically did that. Mm -hmm. um, and not that much has happened. And 
it seems to me, and I'd be curious what you think, was that it was a really powerful card that Russia has played enormously badly because it doesn't have the revenue from Europe anymore. It's not able to threaten it, uh, th- threaten to cut off Europe. Um, I'd be interested to hear your opinion. You know, yes, I certainly agree on that energy weapon, which you know, in turn, they're they're one and the same. But uh, firstly, Russia started toggling and driving up European gas prices already um, in late 2021. Uh, secondly, I think that Putin, uh, you know, a lot of this we won't know until we have access to the Russian archives. And I very much hope there is a free Russia again one day sooner rather than later where I can go and look into these archives. Um, uh, but I do think that there was a clear decision making there saying, okay, now is also an economically advantageous time because of the rising inflation pressures coming out of COVID as, as the world moves to readjust um, and get its markets meeting um, the sort of demand uh, that had built up during um, the COVID lockdowns uh, and then the sort of bottlenecks that came up as, as a result of that, uh, that. That played a decision in, in Kremlin thinking that he could use economic tools to drive Europe apart and potentially even keep them out of the sanctions regime uh, uh, at the beginning of 2022. Uh, I think he failed there in large part because he fails to consider sort of societal and constructivist ideas, which is that if this war had taken place in Syria on the southern or on the southern side of the Black Sea, Europe's response never would have been the same. Mm. Um, we've seen no sanctions response at all over Azerbaijan's uh, um, conflict with its indigenous ethnic Armenian population and continued occupation of neighboring Armenia, uh, and actually Europe buying more Russian uh, uh, Azeri gas during that time. My my view is that really it's because Armenia and Azerbaijan are on the south side of the Black Sea and therefore not European, whereas uh, Ukraine uh, is easier for European policymakers to see and understand as European, um, given it's on their doorstep. Um, but anyway, back to, to sort of the point, you know, I think that Putin did use that weapon. Um, it did have a, that... R- Russia's war and Putin's invasion of Ukraine is the core driver of inflation and why we've had to have uh, such interest rate increases in the West over the last year, which does have real political costs and does potentially uh, threaten to enable um, more Russian-friendly politicians to come to power uh, 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 across the West. Of course, in the United States, that's that's a big concern, um, although inflation seems to have been tackled a little better there. Uh, and across Europe, it's a concern already as well, um, You know whether we see it in Slovakia, where disgraced politicians uh, formerly um, accused of involvement in the murder of a journalist and horrible corruption have now returned to power, uh, in part because they've used anti-Ukrainian rhetoric and rhetoric about inflation and the cost of living to, to call for a change there. Um uh, something that we'll see in, in Romania and its elections next year and the year after and other European um, battlegrounds, as, uh, electoral battlegrounds as well. Um, yes, I, you know, Putin's weapon was ultimately for those constructivist and sort of societal reasons, um, uh, in my view, not as a, quite as effective as he hoped it would be. Um, and because we had Western countries who had leadership who were happy to stand up and understood what was at stake in Ukraine, I think, more than, than other recent politicians have. What I would say finally, though, is Russia still has plenty of economic weapons left to use, right? And, you know, we see that, in, and sometimes we, we have to, we can only really understand them in the aftermath, right? We saw, for example, Russia's withdrawal from the Black Sea Grain Initiative, the deal that it enabled grain to continue to flow out of Odessa and Russian ports, um, in, in and Russian-occupied ports um, in, in the Black Sea, uh, in, in July of this year. Uh, and one of the key, you know, impacts of that was not, it actually didn't have as much of a uh, impact on global grain prices as expected, but what it did have was uh, an impact of Ukraine having to shift its grain exports to go through Europe, that driving down grain prices there, and then big political squabbling Mm. between Ukraine, Mm. Slovakia, Poland. Um, So, you know, ways that Putin can still use these tools even if there isn't a global macro price impact to try to stir up divisions. Plenty of examples in the book of stuff like that in, in Europe between 2014 and 2022 as well. Um, Russian policy looking to drive up those divisions. Um, finally, the one that I would say is we already spoke earlier about, you know, I think Putin's willingness to bear greater costs and his willingness to prioritize the war over his economy. Um, and now that we talk about, um, you know, of course, the situation and the horrible tragedy of the terrorist attacks in, in Israel and, and uh 
the ethnic cleansing that uh, I fear the uh, Netanyahu government wishes to carry out in, in, in Gaza as a result. You know, there's been a, there was a, a, been a lot of talk. Oh, does this pretend a new, you know, 1970s Arab oil embargo type scenario or, or um, where, where uh, Middle Eastern countries drive up the global oil price by refusing to supply to Western countries um, uh, and in turn use, you know, effectively an economic weapon of their own. Um, I'll leave the Middle Eastern geopolitics aside to say I worry far more about Putin basically saying over the next year, you know what, I'm willing to let Russian oil exports fall 50 percent, even go to zero Mm. um, to try to drive up the global oil price, which could go to as high as two hundred dollars, maybe more uh, in that kind of scenario. Putin can bear that pain for a few months without having major ramifications. Um, uh, you know, maybe they, they would come, but I certainly think Putin could experiment with something like that for two or three months and basically say all Russians need to, you know, grit our teeth and do whatever. It's going to be really tough, but we need to do this to win the war. If he does that at the right time, you know, that could very much shift the U.S. election. Mm-hmm. Um, if the price at the pump is, you know, normally it's a political issue in the U.S. when it's $4 a gallon, very cheap by European standards because the, there aren't the same, that's basically a dollar a liter. Um, that's because there aren't the same um, taxes on it in the U.S. But, you know, if all of a sudden it's 10, then, you know, the whole political dynamic in the U.S. changes dramatically. So I think there are still weapons there that Putin can use and is willing to use, and we shouldn't, uh, although they didn't have all of the intended impacts in in 2022, um, dealing with the balance of Russian oil getting out into the international market and other Russian uh, commodities so as to not have the Western policy cause more political damage than it brings benefits in terms of constraining Russia is one that we, we do have to consider. And um, I don't think Russia is, you know, as, as, as I say in the book, um, you know, I don't think uh, – the economic war is one that Russia can win, but it is one that the West can lose. And I don't think that we should consider it uh, over yet. Well, cool. thank you so much. Thank that you so much really, for having me. Really I really enjoyed this. All right. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs>